Dr. Shabir, welcome to Let the Quran Speak. My pleasure to be on. Part one of our series on fantastical stories in the Quran commentaries, and we are looking at chapter two of the Quran now. And uh, this chapter talks about the earth being on the back of an animal. So Dr. Shabir, maybe you can begin by giving us a little bit of a description of where that comes from. Yeah, so, uh, um, I mean, uh, the, the commentators will say now that this comes from um, foreign sources, and they would say Israel uh, sources, um, uh, blaming it on another community. But uh, Muslims have had to think about uh, a verse of the Quran in the second chapter, the 29th uh, verse, where God says, he is the one who created the earth and whatever is therein, uh, and and then turned to the heavens and uh, made it into seven heavens, and he is um, uh, of all things knowing. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the, uh, there was some cosmological um, um, thought that, that has to go into like you know how how does how was the uh, earth uh, created? How do we have seven heavens and all of that? So most of us would go past it and say, okay, it must mean something in the mind of God and uh, whatever it is, it's not so very uh, important to us. We just know that this refers to the majesty of God and, um, and, and we move on, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but the commentators want to go into detail. Okay, how is it seven heavens? How did these seven heavens come about? And instead of going to the cosmologists and astronomers of their day to find out, uh, their method is to relay traditions. Hmm. And, uh, and they will take the traditions that were relayed to them by people before them, who relayed from people before them, who relayed the information from people before them, as far back as they can trace, with mm -hmm. the, the ultimate goal being the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Uh, but uh, often these stories do not go back to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him himself, uh, they go back even ostensibly to either the companions of the Prophet or to people from the second generation of Muslims. Mm -hmm. And even at times when the reports would ostensibly go back to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, one should uh, have a question about that. Do they really go back to the Prophet, peace be upon him, or is just, uh, are these reports falsely attributed to him? In any case, the report that I'm about to deal with is not even attributed to the Prophet, peace be upon him. I have here um, the tafsir of uh, Ibn Kathir, a very famous tafsir. It's called mm -hmm. Tafsir al-Qur'an al-Azim, uh, the, uh, the exegesis of the great Qur'an. And um, this is a very famous popular tafsir today, and it is used widely, uh, especially by people who take that literalist approach, uh, who would generally discount such stories and, and castigate them as being Israeliyat. They come from Jewish and Christian sources. According, that's, that's a terminology used by Muslims uh, to refer to these stories in a blanket way and to discard them. Mm -hmm. uh, but they're there in, in, the, in the classical commentaries, even in this one. And, and the irony is that uh, Ibn Kathir is one of those who warns against uh, incorporating such stories. Mm -hmm. And often when he has such a story, he will do his best to show either there is a weakness in the chain of uh, relay persons who related, uh, relayed this narrative to us so that it cannot be uh, traced authentically back even to the companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Uh, or he will say, you know, something is very strange in this, in, in which case he is applying a principle of discounting a narrative because of its contents, mm -hmm. um, which uh, the literalists often do not apply. Mm -hmm. y you see, if, if you say we're going to apply reason, uh, then we hear a narrative and we say, okay, that doesn't make sense. It couldn't come from the Prophet, peace be upon him. Where did you get this from? Um, or we're applying the test on the chain of uh, authorities and we're saying, okay, well, these are good authorities. So even though uh, our minds are not quite so accommodating to it, we, we have to fix our minds because the report is authentic. Mm -hmm. And if this is coming from the companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him, they are the prime exegetes of the Quran from among Muslims after the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So we have to accept it. Uh, so, so normally, uh, Ibn Kathir will try these strategies to discount the traditions. But this one he doesn't discount, uh, probably because uh, uh, he, he is able to credit it uh, to uh, companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him. He names them as uh, Ibn Masud and Ibn Abbas. And he even adds, so, uh, uh, mm -hmm. so um, several companions, you might say. 
so what do they say? They say that, uh, and I'll just uh, give a brief uh, part of the narrative here, uh, that uh, before, uh, like when God intended to create everything, so he had already created water, so a, a, a smoke arose from the water, uh, and uh, so it raised up above the water, and uh, it uh, hovered above it. So from the, the verb for hovering, uh, uh, then, then he gets, uh, so it was called so, so the name sky comes from the fact that this smoke rose up and, mm -hmm. and hovered above. Okay. Um, uh, then the, the water dried up on, on the ground and, uh, and uh, God made it into a, a single earth, but then he split it so that it became seven earths uh, within two days. Uh, and then um, that those are, he even gives the two days there um, uh, and on the Sunday and Monday. Uh, and now, surprisingly, فَخَلَقَ الْأَرْضَ عَلَى هُوتْ And then he, uh, he, he, made, he created the earth upon a whale. Uh, so that's the same whale that God mentioned in the Quran in the beginning of the 68th uh, chapter. And the, the, the whale naturally is in water. And the water is on a smooth rock. And, and this smooth rock in turn is on the back of an angel. And the angel is in turn on another rock. And, the, and the, that rock is in the wind. Uh, uh, so if, if we uh, just pause there, yeah. you can see so, that we have So it here, doesn't fit with our understanding of science at all, um, right? Nobody's understanding yeah. of science. <laughs> and even then, if you see... If, so where do you think these stories came from? Do you think that this was like the widely held understanding of cosmology at the time? And people just took those stories that were widely held? And applied it to Quranic verses. You know, you know, uh, I, I wish we had like a time machine so we can go back and see what exactly was happening on the ground. But you know, we can only have some surmises about what was happening. And um, surmises aside, what is surprising to me is that uh, when we speak about the development of Muslim science, Muslims and non-Muslims agree uh, that uh, in the Middle Ages uh, the um, uh, the, the, the Muslims were the uh, developers and pioneers and the ones to advance science in so many different areas mm -hmm. uh, in terms of, um, you know, mathematics and cosmology and uh, astronomy, all of these various uh, areas of science. Uh, so instead of the, the writers of the tafsirs of the commentaries on the Quran consulting the scientists of their day on these scientific questions, they were relaying traditions. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and these traditions may have originated from people who, it, it wouldn't have been the common cosmology of the day. It would have been like what common people might have thought mm -hmm. then and perhaps even up until recently. There's an interesting story about Bertrand Russell. It is said that he was giving a lecture and he was talking about, you know, the earth and, and how, you know, the cosmos are arranged. Uh, is arranged. And uh, an old lady, uh, they always pick an old lady for this. <laughs> Uh, as if, you know, um, uh, men are intelligent, women are not. But nonetheless, this, this story goes like this, that the lady stood up and said, uh, um, young man, uh, let me tell you, the earth is on the back of a turtle. So he asked her, okay, so what's, what's the turtle upon? And the lady says, I, I can see where you're going with this, but I'll tell you in advance, it's turtles all the way down. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the, the story illustrates that even up until re recently, uh, some people could have thought simplistically about the earth and how it, uh, it, it's held up. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there is the Greek myth, in Greek mythology, there is Atlas holding up the earth, right? So if we, if we think about that, it's interesting that in Bagobi's, Al Bagobi's tafsir, ba Al Bagobi uh, was a famous uh, commentator of the Shafi school. He died in the year 516 of uh, the Muslim era, mm -hmm. uh, which would mean in the late um, um, uh, 11th uh, century, uh, late 12th century. Mm -hmm. and, and at that time, you know, Muslims have already developed uh, so many advances in, um, in cosmology and astronomy. They had um, observatories in Maraga and Seville and so many places. Uh, so uh, al Bagui relates uh, uh, this story in part, but mm -hmm. in an expanded version, 
Uh, the expanded version even uh, includes a bull. Uh, so, so we started here with the whale being on the, on the, on the rock. Uh, but uh, the, the whale on the water, on the rock, on the back of an angel, on the back of another, on, on, on another rock, and so on. But uh, he has even a bull. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, first of all, we start with an angel who holds the seven earths in its, in its arms. Uh, and then, but the angel had no foothold. So God sent down a bull uh, from heaven, uh, having 40 horns and 40 hooves. And uh, the angel uh, stood on the, on the hump of the, of the bull, but his foothold was still not stable. So God sent down an emerald from heaven uh, that would be placed on between the, from the hump of the bull to the ear of the bull. And the angel was able to stand on that. But the, 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 the bull had no foothold. Mm -hmm. So the bull had to stand on, on the whale and so on and, and the rest we know. So uh, these, these fantastic stories to be related in the books of Tafsir uh, should give us pause. Some people think, well, yeah, we can just clean up the tough series by removing these uh, stories. Uh, but no, that, that, that uh, would not do justice to what the tough seers are as a whole. Uh, to do justice to them, we have to understand that the whole tough seer, like uh, they're, they're, the, the tough seer or the commentary, is, is permeated by a certain worldview. And that worldview includes things like this. In other words, what was possible for the commentators to believe at that time? And what did they think that their readers would believe? Mm -hmm. You see, in modern times, like we have this Tafsir al-Quran al that I just held up. We have many uh, synopses of this, like uh, truncated versions, summary versions. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the summary versions are, are translated into English, at least one summary version, available in 10 volumes, published by Dar, Dar es Salaam publishers. Uh, though it seems to be a large uh, um, a spread of books, uh, it does not include that story which we just read. So, so that's fine. We don't need to know that story. But what we do need to know is that the whole, the whole tafsir was written by a person who could believe such a story and who mm -hmm. could think that his readers would believe such a, a story. Otherwise, he wouldn't include it. That's why we do not include it today. Mm -hmm. And every once in a while, you might have somebody who uh, is not very well trained uh, or not very much experienced. He goes to give a sermon in the mosque and he quotes one of these stories because he reads it in a book and he thinks that because it's in a book, it, it must be worth sharing with the Muslim audience. And most Muslims are looking at that funny and saying, you know, this is not our book, so this is strange. But what needs to be, be done now is that uh, we have to reapply ourselves to the task of exegesis. We have to look at the Quran afresh and uh, use all of the sciences that are available uh, to bring that into uh, the explanation of, of the Quran. Because the Quran is speaking not to uh, dummies, but the Quran is speaking to human beings who are expected to advance in science and technology and in the, our understanding of the world. And the Quran is giving, it's like icing on the cake. You understand the world already, but what you're missing is the morality, the ethical principles, and so on, that needs to come from God. So understand your astronomy uh, from uh, study of astronomy uh, and understand your morality from what God is telling you you should do. So the, 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 in this way, we have harmony between science and, and religion. Otherwise, if we go with these fantastic uh, stories, uh, then even our children will, um, will, will think that we're telling them like silly stories mm -hmm. and, and they're not going to believe in, in what we are trying to uh, explain to them as the moral teachings that uh, are so important to us in our religion. So Dr. Shabir, don't you think that these commentators were drawing from the stories in their lifetime, like things that they understood about the world and applying it to the Quran? to try and understand the Quran a bit better. Yes, yes. They were drawing from their social milieu, um, cultural presuppositions. And it's not only in cosmology. They're doing this like throughout. So if we talk about, uh, you know, the um, rights of women, uh, rights of non-Muslims in the Muslim society mm -hmm. and so on, uh, how does Islam relate to the rest of the world as a political system? Uh, are we at war with the rest of the world or are we in harmony with the world? So, so they're drawing on their cultural presuppositions, and, and they're not always making their cultural presuppositions explicit. It's just like if, if we say uh, everybody will agree that one plus one equals two. So yeah, everybody will be nodding. Yeah, that's true. 
Uh, but I didn't mention the, the presupposition that we know the meaning of one and we need know the meaning of plus and we know the meaning of equals. Mm -hmm. So these are presuppositions. They're there in the background. Um, so they drew on their cultural presuppositions in almost everything. And we're seeing it most evidently in their um, exegesis of verses dealing with cosmology, as in this case. But we'll see also in dealing with other stories like Israelite history and the story of Jesus uh, and his resurrecting uh, people from the dead. So we'll see it most evidently when they uh, come up with these uh, fantastic stories um, and uh, people assume that it is not there in the other areas. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, it's the same worldview um, that, that permeates all areas and we should be aware of that. It doesn't mean they're always wrong. It means that we always have to be conscious uh, that we're dealing with a different worldview. Mm -hmm. And we not approach it uncritically, I guess, Dr. Shabir. That's right. We'll leave it at that, Dr. Shabir. Thank you for your time. You're welcome. Our videos reach people all over the world. We hope you will seize the opportunity to share in the reward from God. Please support us today.